From inside of the warehouse at Oriole Park at Camden Yards, it is the Masson All Access Podcast. Paul Mancano and Brendan Mortensen here with you. Brendan, we were just discussing off air insults that you cannot reply to. You can't come back from that, if you yeah. will. What's your favorite insult that cannot be undone by a response? Yeah, so I was talking about this last week with my good friend Ben McLaughlin, listener of the pod, and, I'm and sure he, he threw out a good one that I think is really hard to come back from, which is if somebody just hits you with a really stern settle down. Because what, what do you say to that? That sounds more How like do you a, come back a from parent that? scolding a child. Right, but imagine... Another adult? If somebody who is around your age hits you with a settle down. Yeah, it's going to be pretty harsh. Mine is probably flex, mm. as in, you know, weird flex. It's short for weird flex. So you say something about some accomplishment, some minor accomplishment that you had, and I say flex. Yeah. You can't come back from that. There's nothing, there's no response that you can have there that will at all save yourself. Right. Because if you're like somewhat proud of something and then somebody hits you with a weird flex, yeah. all of a sudden you're just like, oh, I guess I wasn't that cool. It's, and then you can't say like, it's not a, it's not a flex. Right. Or right, right back at you, you know? I had, there, I had to, there's just nothing there. Speaking of, of things you can't come back from and things you can't really reply to, I had a moment in college, I think it was. I went out with some friends. It was just out to like a Dave & Buster's or something, not, not a sponsor. Uh, but we, if they want a sponsor. But if I mean, they, yeah, they're, they're, yeah, anybody's welcome to. Uh, <laughs> we went out to like a Dave & Buster's, and I was 21 at this point. Okay. So we ordered a round of beers, and uh, I handed, but the, we still looked young because I still look like I'm 15, and we handed our IDs to the waitress, and my friend says, as I'm handing it to the waitress, it's a fake. Ooh. So what do I say to that? I can't. I can't then say it's not a fake because then that looks like a, it really is a fake. The and seed's I, been planted. But at then that if point. I try to pass it off like a joke and continue the joke of it, you know, I, that also looks bad. So she is not going to believe whatever comes out of my mouth next. So she, fortunately, she looked at us very hesitantly. I tried to, in, you know, ensure that it was not a fake because it was not a fake, and. Uh, she gave us drinks nonetheless, but boy, was I worried for a second. That's, that's a tough joke she, to make. Yeah. It's a tough joke to break out. It's a tough joke to put your, your friend in a position of having to answer for. Right. It was a tough moment. Yeah. Needless to say, our friendship dissolved shortly thereafter. <laughs> I have not <laughs> spoken to her since. Uh, it, it was a him. It was a him. I haven't spoken to the waitress, him, him, though, him, either. Yeah. I haven't been back to that place because I feel like I'm, I'm going to sure show up. I'm sure she probably gonna, recalls the moment. I'm going to... You know, she is probably telling this story on her own podcast somewhere right now. Right. Um, at this very moment. It's probably also an Orioles podcast. I, I feel like it could very well be. I feel like as the second I go back there, they're just going to, you know, FBI put my head on the table and cuff sure. me. As the FBI are known to do at Dave & Buster's. They've been waiting for years for this. This is a massive this moment. This sting is their operation. Big and it's just to get... Paul Mancano's fake ID, which is actually a real ID. Real ID. At Dave & Buster's. I'll tell you, Brendan, I'm now a proud owner of a Maryland license, driver's license. Big time. Huge, huge deal. Feels, yeah. feels like a, I, I used to have a PA license, Pennsylvania, and it feels like a piece of plastic compared to that. So, I mean, they're all pieces of plastic. I was going to really say, I mean, it. they're all, all just kind of there. Uh, more ID talk? Do you have any? Yeah, I any? think we should continue the podcast with just a lot of ID talk. Okay, sounds good. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, on this podcast, Brendan... We are going to be discussing the Rule 5 draft, and I know what you're thinking. There was a report last Friday that the Rule 5 draft probably is not going to happen. Ken Rosenthal of The Athletic came out with a report that most execs, he said it was almost unanimous that they want to get rid of the Rule 5 draft, cancel it for this year. Not, not cancel it in perpetuity, but get rid of it this year for a multitude of reasons. The key there being almost unanimous, I would put my savings account on the almost being the fact that Mike Elias was like, now hold on. Yeah. Well, it's an Orioles, you know, it's a big day for the Orioles. We've it talked is. about how the Orioles have used the rule five draft more than any other organization. It predates Mike Elias's tenure. It is an organizational philosophy that you find talent in the rule five draft. And I got to tell you, Brendan, it was a bummer to get that piece of news coming down because we have spent a large portion of our offseason compiling a list of the top 150 Rule 5 draft prospects. Some might say 
too much of our offseason has been spent on researching Rule 5 draft prospects. And you mentioned the top 150. That yes. top 150 was narrowed down from the, what, 200, 250 prospects that we had? So it was more than even just the 150 that we shared. That was a narrowed down list. Yes. So we have, we have really just gone off the deep end in terms of our Rule 5 draft coverage. We have, unfortunately, and that's where we are right now. But, you know, we got to get this out because I said we're, I'll be darned if they cancel this thing and all of our Rule 5 draft content goes out the window. Yeah. And, and we just can't use it. So at this moment, the Rule 5 draft is still on. And so we are going to use this opportunity to get out our Rule 5 Draft content. And right. first and foremost, Bron on Facebook asking, can you explain quickly the Rule 5 Draft? So let's give a, a quick refresher Let's give a on quick the Rule refresher. 5 Draft. So essentially, the Rule 5 Draft is a mechanism that has been in place in the league for decades. I mean, the, the origins of it really go back to quite literally the turn of the 20th century. Um, but it has been used in this kind of format since you know, the 40s, some of the greatest players actually, you know, it's not a long list, but there are some notable names of players who have been through the Rule 5 draft and have uh, been taken by other teams and found success with other teams. Recently, I think of Shane Victorino with the Phillies, Dan Ugla with the Marlins, Roberto Clemente was a Rule 5 draft pick by the Pittsburgh Pirates. And so, of course, with the Orioles, you have Anthony Santander and Tyler Wells, yes. who were Rule 5 draft picks and have succeeded. So it's a way for players who are in organizations that are very deep, in farm systems that are deep and have very good major league teams to find success elsewhere because they're being blocked by other players. So think of teams, the great teams in baseball today, like the Dodgers and Yankees. There are a lot of prospects in those systems that probably will not be able to see crack a big league roster simply because they're being blocked by some of the best players in the game. So it's a way for t other teams to get a look at these guys, you pay $100,000 to take this player in the Rule 5 draft. You can keep him for the entire season. He has to stay on your roster. If you want to send him back, you can offer him back to the original team for $50,000. If they take him, that's a done deal. If not, he's placed on waivers. And earlier in the offseason, that's why we made such a big deal about the deadline to place players on your 40-man roster. So all of the guys that we will be talking about today who are Rule 5 eligible players are players who are not on a 40-man roster of another team. So that's why that deadline was so important. Yeah, and the reasons that the league is looking into potentially canceling this year's, mostly because the roster protections were made back on November 19th, way before... They even arrived at minor league spring training. And by the time a Rule 5 draft has to happen, and because the players that are taken in the Rule 5 draft have to be added to a 40-man roster, and they're in the lockout right now, which prohibits any moves being made to the 40-man roster, they can't have the Rule 5 draft until the lockout ends. And here's the thing, the minor league season starts on April 8th. So odds are the minor league season is going to begin before the lockout ends and all these teams are going to get an influx of new information, new stats on all these players that may or may not have been protected months and months ago that changes the equation. So maybe there's some guy that got left protected. Think of an Orioles example. Adam Hall got left unprotected because his high A stats were not outstanding. What if he jumps out to a terrific start in 2022 and starts hitting 400 and gets moved up to Bowie, and then the Rule 5 draft happens in May? Well, he's going to be the number two pick probably in that Rule 5 draft because the equation has changed. Whereas he might not have gotten taken back in December when the Rule 5 draft should have happened, he's a much different prospect. So teams are saying it's not quite fair for us to lose a guy that we weren't expecting to be good given the formula has changed and we were not expecting the Rule 5 draft to happen four or five months later than it was supposed to happen. Right, and on the opposite side of the coin, if you're a team like the Orioles that has historically been very active in the Rule 5 draft and found a good amount of success there, you'd be pretty happy with the fact that you might get some more information at the start of this minor league season. Yes. But a vast majority of teams around the league are not going to be active in the Rule 5 draft and are probably more worried about losing players than they are about gaining players from this process. 
So the reason that probably a lot of teams around baseball are hoping to cancel the Rule 5 draft is because they don't want that new information to get out there about their players, whereas a team like the Orioles might benefit from that. They're in the minority. But in the same way, the Orioles could suffer from that as well. They could. For the example of Adam Hall coming out to a great start, Robert Newstrom being discovered. He was left unprotected back in November. So it will just throw a wrench into things. And I think that's the reason why they're looking into canceling it this year. However, we are going to look at the top prospects in case it does happen. They haven't canceled it yet. They haven't canceled it yet. And we're going to get our content out there now because we have a whole lot of content. If you haven't yet, go to our Twitter handles, at Paul Mancano, at Brandon Morty. We have compiled a list of our top 150 prospects. It is slightly Orioles-centric, so we took out a lot of first basemen because Orioles don't have a need at that position. We took out some outfielders because the Orioles appear to have a glut of those kind of positions. We looked at a lot of infielders because the Orioles have a massive need in their infield. We looked at some catchers because the Orioles could use a catcher as well. But primarily, we looked at starting pitchers and relief pitchers because over the last two Rule 5 drafts in 2019 and 2020, and this, by the way, this podcast is called the 2021 Rule 5 Draft, even though I know what year we're in. I'm calling it the 2021 Rule 5 Draft, similar to how the Olympics were called 2020 when it was 2021. I'm just rolling it over because uh, it's we weird. Can't have Nothing two makes sense. 2022 Rule 5 Draft picks. Uh, so, Rule 5 Drafts, excuse me. So, over the last two, the Orioles have taken four pitchers. So it's clear, if we study the trends, the Orioles have changed their strategy over the last few years. Let's jump back to 2018, Mike Elias' first draft in the Rule 5 draft that December. He had only had the Orioles job for about a month when he took Richie Martin and Drew Jackson, two A top 30 defensive first speedy middle infielders who were coming off very good seasons, and it gave the O's hope that it was a sign that they were going to take a leap at the plate. So Richie Martin had just hit 300. He was a 24-year-old prospect. He was the number one, pro- number 21 prospect in the Oakland A system. Drew Jackson was 25, coming off a good year at Double A from the Dodgers system, where he was the number 26 prospect. The Orioles didn't select him, but they traded for him after the Phillies took him in the first round. And I think... That just goes to show that the Orioles will take a position player, but the position player probably has to be outstanding in the minor leagues for the Orioles to consider them. When you're looking at pitchers that the Orioles have drafted, at least over the last few years, the trend seems to be that they have a dominant trait or they have one or two plus pitches and it can work those pretty well immediately at the major league level, even if they're not developed all the way. The position player will probably need to have the full package because you're asking them to be in the lineup, you're asking them to play defense, whereas if you draft a pitcher in the Rule 5 draft, maybe you can hide them in the bullpen a little bit and maybe those one or two dominant traits will come out. I think that was definitely the strategy in 2020 when they took Max Aroller and Tyler Wells. Both of those guys were two lower to mid-level in terms of how high they got in their own respective farm systems. They were unranked in the top 30s in their farm systems. They had low whip, high strikeout numbers, and they were both starting pitchers with a couple dominant pitches, like you said. So for Tyler Wells, he rode those dominant pitches to be an effective reliever for the Orioles in 2021. It didn't work out for Max Aroller, but both those guys were very good in high A in 2019 before they were taken in the Rule 5 draft. However, if you go back to 2019 Rule 5 draft, the Orioles took Brandon Bailey and Michael Rucker, and that strategy was a little bit different because those two guys, they had high strikeout numbers, but they didn't have dominant pitches. They had deep repertoires. Brandon Bailey had five different pitches, and both those guys have since made their major league debuts with their respective clubs, but neither of those guys cracked the spring training roster. And if you look at the six guys that the, or, or the opening day roster, if you look at the six guys that the Orioles have taken, since Mike Elias took over, really only one of them can be considered a success, which is, you know, fair considering the nature of the Rule 5 draft, and that's Tyler Wells. The only other guy who's still in the system is Richie Martin, and shortly before the lockout, he was sent down, he was outrighted, so he was removed from the 40-man roster. So the Orioles have adjusted their strategy as the Rule 5 draft has gone along. They went with position players the first year, 
they went with two pitchers with deep repertoires the second year, and the third year they went with two pitchers with dominance with a couple dominant pitches. And I wouldn't be surprised if that continues to be the strategy this year, especially when you're looking at pitchers. I think it makes a lot of sense what you said with Tyler Wells, where he was a starter and he was able to get by with good numbers because he had a few dominant pitches. Well, a few dominant pitches might not translate very well if you're asking them to be a starting pitcher at the major league level, but if you're asking them to eat an inning or two out of the bullpen, maybe they can continue to get by with that one dominant pitch or two because that seems to be a a pretty solid strategy and it worked out well with Tyler Wells. Right, and I think that they learned something from the Brandon Bailey-Michael Rucker experiment, which was they were betting on those deep repertoires and it didn't work out and neither of them ended up being a, a good starting pitcher, whereas, you know, now they're looking more for relievers. So based on the information that we got from them, I think both of us tend to think that the Orioles will probably take at least one pitcher in the Rule 5 draft. They're probably going to take two guys, and at least one of those guys will be a pitcher, probably two. But we looked at, there's a deep list of both position players and pitchers who are very talented, who are left exposed. So we're going to give you our top 20, Brendan. Yeah. Of our top 150, we narrowed it down to 20 guys who were left unprotected. I think we got to start with the position players and yeah. start with Oscar Gonzalez. Yeah, so I would be very surprised if the Orioles took an outfielder. So with these outfielders, I think you and I were both kind of looking for dominant traits among guys that could come up to the league and and at least do one thing very well right off the bat. And with Oscar Gonzalez, his defense is not very good. He's not the speediest guy in the world, but the dude absolutely mashed at double A. And he would make sense to come up and, and be a maybe a right fielder DH type right away. But for Oscar Gonzalez, you're just looking at the power tool and the hit tool. He hit 330 with a 968 OPS at double A. If you can hide him in right field, that's a middle of the lineup hitter. Yeah, and he got called up to AAA where he had 18 homers and an 808 OPS. Big dude, six foot four, 240. Um, like you said, he would have to be a corner outfield or DH, which the Orioles don't have a need for but that maybe the talent is enticing enough for them to ignore the position in this case. And as you'll see throughout our top 20, we took a different a, a variety of guys. So he's probably the most, the least versatile defensively of the position players that we selected for our top 20. Yeah, and in these outfielders that we have in the top 20, it, the mentality is the same where you're at that point, you're not drafting for need. You're just drafting good baseball players. Yeah. So, Oscar Gonzalez falls under that category. It's not a need. He's just good. Yeah. So, next up, Vinny Capra, a better, versatile, more versatile defensive player, but a guy who hit very well coming over from uh, the Toronto Blue Jays system. Yeah, he would make a lot more sense in terms of positional need because he can play second base, shortstop, or third base. And he also hits for average. He hit 327 with a 945 OPS in 72 games at double A. The power isn't really there with Vinny Capra, but the defense, he's versatile enough to play all around the infield, and the average was good. So I think Vinny Capra would make a lot of sense if you're just looking for a versatile infielder that maybe you could throw in as a backup to start the season. If somebody needs an off day somewhere, Capra could get some time. He's 25 years old, which the Orioles have gotten older as the Rule 5 draft has gone along. They started with Richie Martin was 24. That was the youngest player that they ever took in the Rule 5 draft under Mike Elias. Youngest of those six. And they took Tyler Wells last year, who was 26 at the time. So they're not afraid of taking somebody who's a little bit older. I think our cutoff is probably going to be about 27. That seems a little too old. Yeah. But they're not afraid of taking a 25-year-old by any stretch. Buddy Kennedy is 23. So he would be the youngest player that the Orioles would have taken. Arizona Diamondback system. He's a third baseman. He hit 290 with 22 homers between high A and double A, and he can also play second base. I like Buddy Kennedy a lot. Yeah, he strikes me as kind of your prototypical power-hitting third baseman, but the second base versatility is also really nice. Buddy Kennedy did not get as high level-wise as maybe we would have liked to see out of a positional player because he did start the year at high A, but like you said, the power is really intriguing. A 523 slugging percentage with 22 home runs, like you mentioned, He's a really exciting option, I think, for the Orioles, especially when you're looking at the fact that Kelvin Gutierrez is probably not your ideal choice to be an everyday starter at third base, 
Buddy Kennedy could come in and start some games at the hot corner. Yeah, it, this would also, of course, depend on if the Orioles make any additions in free agency before the Rule 5 draft starts. We have no idea of the timing of that, but you know, it could be an intriguing option, especially if they don't sign anybody else to a major league deal. You take a Rule 5 guy, and he at least provides depth in the infield, even though he may not be a starter from day one, and you might be able to carry him throughout the season. If that's the important thing for you, if you want to be able to hold on to him, which you should want to be able to hold on to him after 2022, it's not like you're necessarily going to have Gunnar Henderson or Jordan Westberg banging down the door for starting spots there. So you might be able to hide him on your 26-man roster, so to speak. Another guy that you could be able to hide in the outfield, Brandon Lockridge from the Yankee system, 25 years old. He's the number 19 prospect in a pretty deep Yankee system. Now, he is pretty much an, an outfielder, and he's versatile in all three outfield positions, but he can't play in the infield, hasn't played in the infield since his days at Troy. Uh, so he would have to be an outfielder. And the question would be, would the Orioles be comfortable adding another outfielder considering they have Austin Hayes, Cedric Mullins, Anthony Santander, if he's not traded, with Kyle Stowers and Robert Newstrom ready to come up. Yeah. And Brand Ryan McKenna. Brandon Lockridge, as you rattled off of those outfield names, he does not present a need. He's just a really, really good baseball player. He has a run tool of 75, which is just five points off of the maximum grade of 80, which tells me that he would probably be at least an above average defensive center fielder right off the bat. Yeah. And not only does he have that spectacular run tool, he also slugged 557. So he's got the speed. He's got the power. I know he's not a need, but this is a really good baseball player. I do want to give a quick shout out to Vivek, who's one of our biggest fans uh, and has done a lot of Rule 5 draft research himself, uh, commenting along on this podcast, uh, saying Buddy Kennedy made the top 100 zips projection on fan graphs at number 59. Yeah. So people like him, especially as a prospect. Yeah, I, I like Lockridge a lot because of that uh, bat-to-ball skills. We've seen how much the Orioles prioritize bat-to-ball skills in particularly look at Colton Kowser and Connor Norby. Um, it's the ability to make contact and to drive the ball uh, at least to the wall in doubles power, as they say. Yeah, a, a 557 slugging percentage with a 75 run grade is just an unbelievable combination, combination of speed and power. Uh, next up, a catcher. Now, it's very rare that teams take catchers in the Rule 5 draft because... It's such a hard position to make the transition from the minors to the big leagues, and especially if you're coming from double A to, to the big leagues. That's a huge jump to make. What you have to handle mentally, what you have to handle with a new pitching staff, catching guys that you've never caught before, throwing runners out, in addition to your workload at the plate. And it's just a difficult position to throw a young guy into and give him that spot and say, you have to hold down a roster spot all 162. However, the reason I could see the Orioles going with a catcher is because they only have a couple minor league free agents as their ready opening day catchers. If Adley Rutschman doesn't make the opening day roster, they're looking at Anthony Bemboom and uh, who am I forgetting? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and Jacob Nottingham as their opening day catchers. So maybe they go with a catcher and use that as a potential stopgap before they call Adley up. Yeah, and Scott Manaya from Houston is the catcher that we have looked at. He's 26 years old, so maybe has a little bit more experience. And he was good at the plate in AA, and he's also good defensively from what scouts have said. He had a 867 OPS with nine homers, so not a ton of power in those 65 games at AA. But the raw power is there. He just hasn't really tapped into it. And like I said, good behind the plate, average arm, and maybe because he's a little bit older, the learning curve would be a little bit easier for him if he made the jump. However, I think we really would have liked to see a Rule 5 draft eligible catcher get some more time at Triple A, but those really weren't available, probably because teams protected them. If they were a good catcher at the Triple A level, that's probably a 40-man roster guy. Right. So Scott Manaya kind of represents one of the better catchers available in the Rule 5 draft, and he didn't even make it up to AAA. And he was our only catcher in our top 20 because we were 
pretty confident in his ability defensively. Whereas a lot of these other guys, it's hard to find a scouting report. We don't have access, as we've said, to minor league defensive metrics. All we can look at is caught stealing and that kind of thing, but that doesn't tell you how they call a game. It doesn't tell you their ability to work with a pitcher. So we were pretty confident in Manaya's ability to call a game and to throw runners out and do the things that is, are necessary behind the plate. But other catchers, we can look at their numbers, but that doesn't give us a complete picture. Yeah, and the other two catchers that didn't make our top 20 that I was at least intrigued by are Josh Bro from the Yankees and Blake Hunt. They're 23 and 24 years old, respectively, but they're just really raw. That's yeah. the scouting report on these guys. I mean, Josh Bro, 24 years old, and his scouting report is just really raw, really toolsy. He's the Yankees' 18th-ranked prospect. He did have a 774 OPS at AA, and the ceiling is high, but he's not really close to that ceiling at this point, and the same case is to be made for Blake Hunt who is the 15th ranked prospect in the Rays system. He's 23 years old, and he's apparently great defensively so far, but the offensive numbers are not that great. And at 23, that's a massive jump after he only had 17 games at double A. So those are pretty much the two catchers after Scott Mania that I thought were intriguing, but they're both so raw that I think drafting them in the Rule 5 draft and asking them to all of a sudden play in the major leagues is just way too big of a jump. Another aspect that might be intriguing for the Orioles is versatility, defensive versatility, utility guys who can play both in the infield and outfield. You could make the case that that could be something that the Orioles are looking for in a Rule 5 pick because... They could use a guy, like we said, to play third or second or even short if they need to. But also, if he can fill in in the outfield, that just makes him a little bit more valuable and a little bit easier to keep on your 26-man roster throughout the season. And there's a guy from Tampa Bay whose name I'm going to butcher, so I'm going to give it to you, Brendan. A utility guy, 26 years old. Go ahead. Miles Mastro Bioni. Beautifully said. Maybe. I don't know. My Italian heritage just... (laughs) Flows through that name. He is a solid contact hitter, but struggled with power once he got up to AAA. He did not have a single home run in his 51 games there, but he still had a 775 OPS, which tells me that he probably had some gap-to-gap power, even if he didn't have the home run power. And like you said, he can play second base, he can play shortstop, or he can play the outfield and would just make sense as a backup utility guy that is valuable to have on the bench even if the bat is not quite there, at least he can fill in defensively for you where you need him. He's not our only Tampa Bay Rays prospect that we're going to be discussing in our top 20. A very, very deep system. They rival the Orioles and Pirates for the deepest systems in baseball. It was impossible, and of course, because they have such a great four, uh, you know, 26-man roster, they have a great major league club. It was very difficult for them to keep everybody, so a lot of guys maybe slipped through the cracks. However... Keep in mind, with Tampa Bay, they are cream of the crop in terms of developing guys. So maybe there are some stats and some abilities that the Rays were able to lock into that might not fully translate once they get out of that Rays system. Yeah, and another organization that had a lot of really good prospects that we've looked at, the St. Louis Cardinals, one of them being Delvin Perez, who is Mm. the shortstop who I'm really intrigued by because his scouting report will tell you that he is maybe already a star defender at shortstop. Kind of reminds me of the Richie Martin pick a little bit. The offensive numbers were not quite what Richie Martin was giving you at double A at the time. But for Delvin Perez, the offensive numbers are still good enough and 24 stolen bases doesn't hurt either. Where if he's a star defender at shortstop at just 23 years old and the Cardinals 12th ranked prospect, that's a lot of potential. It is. And like you said, I mean, Martin was a 300 hitter. Perez is not. But... If the Orioles want to take a swing and be able to keep him in their in the fold for a while, that could be a long-term play. You just swallow his maybe a down year of production, and that's what the Orioles were hoping to do with Richie Martin. You know, they gave him an everyday spot for the most part at shortstop back in 2019, and he floundered, but they were hoping he would cash in on his potential long-term. It hasn't worked out that way. So maybe the Orioles are trending away from that because the Richie Martin experiment didn't go that well. But I will say, I think Perez has a chance to be a better defender at shortstop than Richie Martin was coming right. out at the time. The question is, are you how low can his batting average get before it's unpalatable? You'd have to take your lumps yeah. at the plate. Because 
Richie Martin was hovering around the Mendoza line for quite a while in 2019. And there are legitimate questions about whether bringing a guy up to the big leagues before he's ready can hurt his development. Right. And long-term can really mess with him. So it, it's a question of whether the, the Orioles want to take that gamble. Michael Stefanik is much more polished. Would he not is, have to take your lumps at the plate with no, him. Hopefully. I mean, comes from the Angel system. He's 26 years old. Second baseman. He hit a whopping 334 with 16 homers and a 913 OPS in 104 games at AAA. I don't know why the Angels didn't protect this guy. I think he's an outstanding hitter. I know he's 26, so a little bit older. But this is what the Orioles would look for in a draft prospect, not not a Rule 5 draft prospect, in an MLB draft prospect. I see him, he's a little bit smaller. I see him as a Connor Norby type. Yeah, because his plate approach is incredibly advanced, which, I mean, makes sense for an older guy at the AAA level, but 62 strikeouts to 45 walks. The dude struck out just 62 times in 104 games. That's incredibly good. I don't know why he, like I said, I don't know why he didn't get protected. And this is exactly what the Orioles might look for. He might be my favorite position player of our top 150. Yeah. Because I think he's a great, and look, the Orioles already went to that well by taking Jacob Nottingham, who came from, was it Jacob Nottingham? Anthony Benboom, excuse me, coming from that system because they liked his bat-to-ball skills in the minor leagues. So maybe they, they go back with Michael Stefanik. One last position player to discuss here, Brendan, Samad Taylor. You, you like him a lot, coming also from uh, Toronto system. Yeah, one of my favorite players, position players that we have in our top 20. Samad Taylor, just 23 years old, is a top 20 prospect in the Blue Jays system. We haven't really touched on this much, but it would be kind of nice to steal some top 20 prospects from teams within the AL East. But Samad Taylor, a utility guy, which we mentioned would be incredibly valuable for the Orioles. He hit 294 with an 888 OPS in his 87 games at Double A. 16 homers, 17 doubles, 30 stolen bases, and he can play second base, third base, left field, or center field. I know the outfield versatility is not really a need, so Samad Taylor doesn't really fill a need there, but the second base, third base versatility would be huge. Yeah, it would be very enticing. And like you said, the combo of speed, a little bit of power, and bat-to-ball skills, that's ideal. Yeah. That's what you look for. 30 stolen bases and 16 homers. Yeah. So while the Orioles, like we said, I think they'll, they will continue to target pitchers, and we're going to get into our pitchers next. I mean, that's a, that list of guys, just maybe they take, if one of those guys slips through the cracks, maybe they take him with their second pick yeah. to, to, at the start of the second round of the major league phase of the Rule 5 draft. Yeah, as we get into our pitchers, I think there's a pretty good chance that the first pick in this Rule 5 draft is a pitcher because there are a lot of top end pitchers in this draft that I don't think will last five picks. Yeah. But if one of the guys that we mentioned falls to their second pick in the world five draft, you've got to at least consider it because there are a lot of guys here that could start and make an impact right away. It seems like, yeah. All right. Let's talk about the pitchers because there's a question of whether the Orioles might prefer starters over relievers. You look at the last two guys that they took in the Rule 5 draft, both of those guys were starters. They converted them to relievers, but they were starters in the minor leagues. And I think oftentimes starters are turned into relievers as not a last gasp, but they're generally seen as not having the deepest repertoire, not having the ability to go deep into games like the guys who maintain, you know, the ability to be a starter. So like we've seen with the Orioles They may have to convert guys like Zach Lowther, Alexander Wells, Mike Bauman to relievers at some point because it's very difficult to be a big league starter. I think the Orioles probably would prefer to take a starter, but there are some intriguing relievers, and the reliever numbers are remarkable. You're going to see really low ERAs, really high strikeout rates from the relievers, but the starters have a much more difficult task of going through games and lasting into the fifth and sixth and potentially seventh innings. Yeah, the relievers just aren't really valued as much around the league because when you are protecting players and adding them to your 40-man roster ahead of the Rule 5 draft, you're going to be much more likely to add starting pitchers or quality outfielders or quality infielders. Relievers, not that they're a dime a dozen, but organizations probably feel like they can find reliever talent when they need it, Yeah, and it would be a lot harder for them to find starting pitching talent. So that's why a lot of these relievers are going to have 
just unbelievable numbers, like you said. I know you're intrigued by a starter from Kansas City system, a left-handed pitcher named Austin Cox. I am. He is my favorite to be the Orioles pick with the first pick in the Rule 5 draft. If you're on baseball Twitter, all of baseball Twitter was shocked when Austin Cox was not placed on the Royals 40-man roster. He is a top 15 prospect in the Royals system. No matter where you looked, MLB Pipeline, those rankings aren't updated yet. But as of the previous rankings, he was the 12th ranked prospect in a pretty good Kansas City system. He had 15 starts at AA with an ERA of 3. Not incredible strikeout numbers with just 8 Ks per 9, but he has 3 plus pitches, including a really good 12-6 curve. I think Austin Cox, if the Orioles draft him knowing that he was a starter in the minor leagues, I think he's one of the few guys on this list that I could realistically see the Orioles trying to keep as a starting pitcher. And at worst, you have a reliever with 3 plus pitches. Yeah, I mean, you look at his 2019 season... He was outstanding, 276 ERA at just 22 years old between single A and high A. And while he missed some time this past year, great at double A, like you said, before we just didn't see enough of him at triple A, just 24 years old. He's very enticing as a prospect, a lefty as well. You could either, like you said, use him as a starter if he really amazes you in spring training, or you can just keep him as a reliever. Another lefty that I like from Kansas City, Josh Dye. He's not in the Royals' top 30 prospect list, but he had a 2.60 ERA with 10 Ks per nine as a reliever in 65 and two-thirds innings between AA and AAA. So he's gotten up to the higher levels at 25 years old, and he's a 2018 23rd rounder from out of Florida Gulf Coast. I'm intrigued by him, even though he is a reliever. Yeah, but he's a good lefty reliever with good strikeout numbers, which is why he's a bit higher on our list than some of the other right-handed relievers with good strikeout numbers, because lefties are just harder to come by, and good lefties in the bullpen are a lot harder to come by. But Josh Dye is 25 years old, so getting a little bit closer to our cutoff, but I don't think the age matters as much when you're looking at a reliever. Well, 26 years old, Brady Feigl, who out of Oakland's system, he's the 24th ranked prospect for them. Starter on MLB Pipeline, they noted he was a high spin rate guy on his fastball. The Orioles love that. It's partly why they took Carlos Tavera in the fifth round of the MLB draft. Uh, 471 ERA with just nine strikeouts per nine and 25 starts. So those numbers are not fantastic. 471 ERA. But remember, Max Aroller and Tyler Wells didn't have incredible numbers. So Roller's ERA was close to five. It wasn't, or, sorry, close to four in high A before he was taken. Not close to five, so the Orioles would have to take a chance with Brady Feigl. He's got a bit of a funky delivery, but considering he's a top 30 prospect in a pretty good Oakland system, I thought he was interesting. Yeah, and with the pitchers, this is where, like I was mentioning at the top of the podcast, this is where you get into looking for dominant traits. And the high spin rate is a dominant trait. The Orioles can do something with that. So with Brady Feigl, even though the numbers aren't fantastic, if he has a trait that you can grow and develop, it's a good Rule 5 draft pick. Righty from Tampa Bay system. I don't know how to say his last name. Gao? Christopher Gao? Christopher Gao. Gao. Tell us about him, Brendan. Uh, His numbers are unbelievable. He he did not work very high in the minor league system. He got up to just double A. But there in just seven games, he had a 231 ERA with over 16 strikeouts per nine. That's insane. It's ridiculous. So Christopher Gao, a little bit older at 25 and did start the year at high A, which isn't fantastic. He had a 341 ERA there. But again, 14 and a half strikeouts per nine at high A. So he's working with something. Felix Bautista was protected by the Orioles because of his ridiculously high strikeout numbers and because he had elite stuff. Maybe the Orioles could target guys in other organizations that have those similar traits. And Gao, I think, would fall under that. Uh, Righty, who's just 22 years old from Toronto system, the number 23 prospect, Adrian Hernandez. Now, he is a reliever, but talk about ridiculously high strikeout rate again. 15.6 Ks per nine for Adrian Hernandez and a 274 ERA between single A, high A, and double A. With that high strikeout rate, you're going to get a high walk rate as well, which Hernandez did have, but he has an elite changeup as well. And you know what stuck out to me about Hernandez is that he is currently on MLB Pipeline, the Blue Jays' 23rd ranked prospect. 
which makes sense as just a pitcher with good stuff, but he's a reliever. Right. You don't see relievers in the top Very 30 rarely. Yeah. unless the stuff is pretty unbelievable. And like you said, he has that dominant changeup. And at just 22 years old, he's probably my favorite to be picked by the Orioles if they draft a reliever. I think they'll go starter, but if they do draft a reliever, Hernandez is my favorite. Another reliever who is in a team's top 30, that's going to be Daisbel Hernandez, who is from Atlanta system, number 26 in their system, 25 years old. He's a righty, 383 ERA. But again, what are we looking for? High strikeout numbers. 12.3 Ks per nine between double A and triple A. And he's got an elite fastball, according to MLB Pipeline. Yeah, and like you said, worked his way up to triple A and has an elite fastball. Dominant traits, that's what we're looking for in the relievers. Now, the oldest guy that we have on this list, lefty Matt Crook from the Yankee system, 27 years old, but his numbers, which they have to be considering he's 27, are absurd. 215 ERA as a starter, 13.5 Ks per nine at double A, and then he goes up to triple A where he has a 317 ERA and 10 Ks per nine. So while the ceiling may not be ridiculously high for a 27-year-old, you feel good about his chances to make an opening day roster. Yeah, it kind of makes you wonder why we're just seeing it now. From Matt Crook, we're seeing those good numbers and and why it came at his age 27 season starting the year at double A, which makes me think, like you said, that maybe the ceiling isn't too high. And I would be surprised if this is the pick by the Orioles. However, at 27 years old with good numbers at triple A, he probably has maybe not the best chance, but one of the higher chances out of the names we've rattled off here to make an immediate impact on the major league roster and and be pretty solid right away. Yeah, and for this next guy, Jacob Lopez, a younger guy, good numbers, 24 years old, lefty, number 23 prospect from Tampa Bay system, great command, uh, a 5.3 strikeout to walk ratio. Lopez, another lefty that maybe you could stick in the bullpen and see what he can do. Well, you know what I think is really intriguing about Lopez too is that the scouting reports say that he doesn't really have electric stuff however when you look at his numbers between high a and double a he had 14 and a half strikeouts per nine so the command must be unbelievable yeah if he has 14 and a half strikeouts per nine innings and the stuff isn't really all that good maybe maybe a zach lowther type situation right the strikeout to walk ratio is incredibly advanced to the point where he is one of my favorite pitchers among the top 20 here because if the command is already that good and maybe you can work on the spin rates or work on something a little bit so the stuff moves a little bit better, the command being excellent is a really good sign. Yep, and righty uh, Joey Murray, intriguing situation for the number 25 prospect from the Blue Jays system. Because he's a starter, had very good numbers last time we saw him, but he missed almost all of 2021 with an uh, injury. And he has an elite sp- sp- uh, fastball spin rate, excuse me, 275 ERA, 11 Ks per nine, but we just did not see enough of Joey Murray, and I think that's why he got left exposed. Uh, Tyler Wells, cough, cough. This is, this is what happened with Tyler Wells. He was injured, missed a minor league season, Twins didn't protect him. He still had the stuff, and the Orioles saw the potential, even though they didn't have the numbers and stats from recent years to back it up. The potential was good enough to draft Tyler Wells in the Rule 5 draft. It could be a very similar situation here. Yep. The stuff is good enough, and even though we haven't really seen recent numbers, the potential is there. Another thing about Tyler Wells, he's a big dude. Tyler Wells is like six foot six, six foot seven, I believe. Yeah. So is this next guy, Cade McClure, 26 years old, number 19 prospect from Chicago White Sox system, a righty, a starter, six foot seven. He's got great control. He's got 10 Ks per nine at double A, and he got up to triple A as well. So similar stature to Tyler Wells. Could the Orioles go back to that Wells, pun intended? Yeah, 10 Ks per nine, like you said. Also just two and a half walks per nine. So the command is really good. The strikeout to walk ratio is great. He screams late inning reliever to me. I don't think Cade McClure would probably be in the starting rotation if the Orioles were to pick him. But if he has a pitch or two that is good enough, I think he could be a pretty good reliever option. Finally, our last guy in our top 20, Sean Semple from the Yankee system. Tell us about him. 
Yeah, 391 ERA, 10.5 Ks per nine in 24 games and 18 starts. The thing that I'm intrigued about with Semple, he was able to move from high A to double A to triple A, which means the Yankees clearly saw something in him where he deserved rapid promotions. We've seen it in the Orioles system this year. The guys who have gotten promoted that rapidly have moved throughout the ranks in the prospect rankings pretty quickly because you see something there and that's why you're promoting them at that rate. So Sean Semple at 26 years old, the numbers aren't amazing, but because he was moved up so quickly, I think that's telling us something about his talent. So those are our top 20 prospects. Brendan, are there any other guys? We came up with 130 more than that. So are there any other guys we didn't touch on that you think we should mention briefly? Oh, goodness. There's a few. Going back to position players, I liked Griffin Conine. I just looked at your list, and my goodness. Yeah, I I have a long list. Uh, Griffin Conine, an outfielder from Miami, was a name that intrigued me. Jeff Conine's son. One dominant trait, and that is that he can just mash the baseball. 36 homers between high A and double A. I don't think he's going to be the pick. He hit 218, and he's a right fielder. Right. Average, not good. But the power was very intriguing. And you have the Orioles Griffin connection Conine. with uh, with Jeff. You do. Jeff's son. So Griffin Conine, I think, was the only position player that I didn't get to mention. There are a few pitchers that I wanted to mention. Uh, Victor Castroneda. Yep. You're looking for an elite pitch when you're looking at pitchers in the Rule 5 draft. Has a drop-off-the-table splitter, according to scouting reports. Nearly 11 strikeouts per nine between high A and triple A. If you're looking for one dominant pitch, he has it. Yeah, and that four eight seven ERA, though, will give teams pause. I'll say that. It will. But an ERA that will not give the Orioles pause, Yeri De Los Santos, mm-hmm. a reliever from, I believe, the Pirates organization, had a 152 ERA and a whip of 845. Those are really good numbers. They are. However, only 23 point. Two, 23 and two-thirds innings pitched right in 2021. Small sample size, but yeah. in the small sample size, he was very good. And then last guy I want to mention, Aaron Pinto. A 2.30 ERA, 14 strikeouts per nine, just under three walks per nine, and a pretty good whip in, again, a smaller sample size of 43 innings at AA. Pretty highly drafted. Uh, no, not highly drafted at all. Excuse me, 24th <laughs> round pick. The opposite of that, yes. yeah. Yeah. Um, a lot of intriguing guys. And There's that's a lot say, of talent out there. Yeah, exactly. And Aaron Pinto, with his 14 strikeouts per nine, didn't crack our top 20. Right. That's just how many good relievers there are. And I think that it's, as teams use the Rule 5 draft increasingly, and I think a lot more teams have started to use it, they also have to leave guys exposed. Because if you're going to be making a pick in the Rule 5 draft, you got to leave yourself some roster spots. So... It's going to be intriguing. Hopefully, we do have a Rule 5 draft to talk about. We will have a live show for that. If we do have a Rule 5 draft prospect, take a uh, draft. Excuse me. Take a look at our uh, top 20 one more time. If you're watching, should be watching on Facebook and YouTube because you got video and pictures of all of these guys that we discussed. And we want to know what you think. We want to hear from you as to guys that may have slipped through the cracks, guys that we're not discussing, that were left out of our top 150, or guys that were in our top 150 that should be in our top 20. And if you find somebody that we did not, more power to you. More power to you. <laughs> because we, we combed. So that would be amazing. It's like the scene from Spaceballs where they comb the desert. Take a giant comb through the desert. Yeah, I'm glad you knew Good what scene. I was talking about. Yeah. Uh, please follow us on all of our platforms. Of course, Mass and Orioles. And please listen on uh, Spotify, SoundCloud, anywhere you get your podcasts. You can watch on the Masson app as well. At Brandon Morty, one more time, is his Twitter handle. I am at Paul Mancano. Thanks so much to Bobby Blanco for producing this podcast. Next week, we will have Steve Molesky on to discuss his list of the top 20 international prospects in the Orioles system. We're going to be talking about that. If you haven't checked that out, you should on MassInSports.com. It's awesome stuff from Steve. We'll catch you next time. Thanks so much for tuning in.